Okay, Mary Wollstonecraft, Jane Austen, and proto-feminism. As I say, there, there's quite a lot of uh, new stuff here, um, helping us understand some of the developments that we've already seen. But uh, can you see clearly? Do we need the curtains closed? We're okay. Yep. All right then. Um, yeah. First of all, I'd like to get our terms sorted out, the, the actual words that we're using to talk about all of this. Um, we need to be a little bit careful about how we use words and what, what, we, what we mean by them. People often use words without saying what they mean by that word. So uh, let's try and get that a little bit clear. Um, firstly, the, this word feminism is something that we, we, we need to be a bit careful about using. Uh, I pointed this out last week, but I'm making the point again because it's an important point. Um, it, it wasn't used, at least, it, and, and when it was first used, it was used with a different sort of meaning anyway. So uh, it, it wasn't used uh, in that sense of um, advocating equal rights for men and women, uh, the, the sorts of things that we've been talking about in terms of women's education or um, uh, the woman's role in, inside a marriage and those kinds of questions. Uh, it wasn't used in that way until later on. So at the time we're talking about it, there wasn't a word, feminism. But still, the idea that women should have equal rights with men obviously goes back further than the, than the word, feminism. So the idea goes back further. So... One way that people get round this sometimes is by calling it proto-feminist. Proto sort of means early or at the beginning of, or, or kind of the origin of, or, or sort of before feminism you've got proto-feminism, you've got a sort of early version or an original basic sort of idea. Uh, but even, of course, even the word proto-feminism didn't exist either. I mean, that, the, these, are, these are words that people are sort of putting onto these concepts later on. Well, I'm just going to use the word feminist generally here. Um, some people would say it's what we call an, an anachronism. Anachronism meaning outside time or without being in the context of the time because those, at that time people didn't use that word. Okay, so an anachronism, an example of an anachronism would be William Shakespeare riding a bicycle. Okay, bicycle wasn't invented at that time, so he couldn't have ridden a bit bicycle, could he? Uh, so that would be an anachronism. Um, taught, using the word feminism for the 18th century, some people will, will sort of say, that's, that's an anachronism, that word didn't exist. But <laughs> what I would want to say is, well, the idea existed, okay, people were developing something that later we called feminism. <coughs> Uh, but, but they were developing that idea. Of the idea of women's rights uh, is a form of feminism. So uh, any writings that are talking about some degree of equality between men and women, I'm just using the word feminism. I'm not going to mess around with proto-feminism. Um, so, yes, come on. There we go. Uh, at the same time, we, we, we should notice that they weren't necessarily the same as what we call feminists today. So uh, the, the things that were important to them, the society was different, the situation was different, so it would make sense that the issues that they were talking about in relation to uh, women's position in society, those issues would also be to some extent different. So in order to understand what, what was important to them and why they felt that was important. We need to understand their society. We need to know how they looked at their world. So um, I'm using the modern word feminism, but it's not going to mean exactly the same as we might think when we talk about feminism today. In fact, they talk about three waves of feminism. And, and we would be living through the sort of, or the, the third wave of feminism would be something that happened in my lifetime. So... Uh, we can talk about these waves of feminism and what the emphasis or focus of that, these different developments in feminism, we can talk about that later on. Um, 
for the moment, I'm going to talk about something completely different, really, to, to, to what we imagine about faith. Well, again, women had a better deal once the monarchy was brought back, once the uh, Puritan Revolution ended and that period of uh, the English uh, Commonwealth when the country was ruled by Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans, once that all ended and, and they brought back a king, uh, things got rather better for women. So it was natural for them to take the, the kind of conservative position. The conservative position cares more about women than the radical uh, Puritan revolutionary position. And so uh, you get uh, a social circle. Uh, we, we, we saw some of these. Uh, we focused mostly on Mary Astor, but we did mention some of these others. Um, Mary Chudley, Judith Drake, Elizabeth Thomas, Elizabeth Elstor, Mary Montague. Um, that little circle grew up in London during the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Uh, it was mostly, you know, the fairly high class women uh, who were in a fairly privileged position. And then along came the blue stocking group that we saw last week. And again, mostly from the sort of social elite. And again, the social elite is going to tend to be more conservative. It always will be because uh, they've got more to lose if things change. It's usually the people underneath who are, are challenging, saying, you, you guys have got too much. You know, um, Look at the French Revolution in the 18th century. Basically, kill the rich. Okay? Kill, the, kill off the elite class. All right? uh, so, um, partly because they were from a higher social class, and partly because the, the uh, revolutionary position of the Puritans was not concerned with giving women a good deal, uh, from those two points of view, uh, those early feminists, or proto-feminists, or call them what you will, uh, tended to be uh, socially conservative. So that's, that's why they're talking about this Tory feminism. Okay. Uh, what were its values? Its values were, like I said, you know, um, Mary Astor wanting to get a, some sort of convent life, like the mon like some monastery, monastic sort of situation back. Um, they're emphasizing piety, going to church, and morality, being a good person, and charity. Like if women, if women show an example to, to, to society, then women will be respected. If we are morally superior, or if we are morally kind of high level, then, then uh, we are going to be uh, respected. So it's sort of, um, we gain our acceptance in this society by taking the moral high ground. We're the ones who go to church. We're the ones who are standing up for Christian values. We're the ones that are giving charity to the poor. We're the ones that are, uh, are kind of keeping a high level of morality. All right, that's, if, if we live up to that, then men should respect us. Okay, so that's the way of basic way of thinking that they're, that they're developing. So on the other side, you've got the Enlightenment feminism. Well, uh, let's just look at the other side of the political fence first. Uh, you've got the Whigs. The Whigs are the antecedents of the Liberal Party, uh, and during the 19th century, a lot of the reforms that went on were, were carried out by the, the Liberal Party. And uh, you get uh, Catherine Macaulay and uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. We, Catherine Macaulay was sort of overshadowed by uh, Wollstonecraft, uh, but they were both, both of them um, tending to favour the Whigs. They weren't completely comfortable with the Whigs, but they tended to favour the Whigs. Um, and they saw women's place in society rather differently. And this is where we start seeing the roots of what we think of as our modern idea of feminism uh, starts coming from these people. The Tory feminists are asking women to get respect in a um, male hegemony, in a male-dominated society by being uh, virtuous, by being saintly and keeping the moral high ground and setting a good example. Uh, on the contrary, uh, women like Macaulay and 
uh, Wollstonecraft are saying, well, this should be a human right. It shouldn't be a reward for being a good girl, you know, like being given a sweetie or something, like a child being given a sweetie or you were a good girl, get a little pat on the head. Um, it shouldn't be like that. It, sh it should be a basic human right to be treated equally. It shouldn't have to be about, you know, whether we're good or not. Men get, men get that privilege whether they behave well or not. Why shouldn't women? Okay? So that's where they're coming from. They're, they're arguing it on the ticket of human rights. And so that's much more where modern feminism has got, got its roots and origins than in the uh, Tory feminism that we see, we've seen mostly so far. So uh, they weren't always uh, comfortably related to the feminists, they, to, to, to the Whigs. They tended to move in a Whig direction, and they tended politically to be more aligned with the Whigs, but they, they didn't always have a comfortable relationship with the Whigs. And so uh, we don't just call them um, Whig, you know, we got Tory feminism, we don't say Whig feminism in the same way because they didn't sit so comfortably with the Whig party, necessarily, the Liberal Party. Um, they, they tend to be called Enlightenment feminists because it's based on that idea of human rights, which is uh, an, a fundamental part of the Enlightenment, the idea that humans have rights. Okay? Um, the sort of social contract includes the idea that you, you have certain rights when you come onto this planet. Uh, so, uh, because of that, they tend to be called Enlightenment feminists, so that's the name that they're usually referred to by. So, where are we going now? Okay, yes. Mary Wollstonecraft herself. Quite an extraordinary person. You're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're in for some fun here. An unexpected life, okay? Uh, very different from the conservative lifestyles of the women that we've, we, we've looked at, um, you know, like Mary Astle or someone like that. Very colourful life. She's extraordinary, not just for her work, but for her lifestyle. And uh, she kind of kick-started the whole idea of women's rights um, by setting a personal example that, that was just, <laughs> well, uh, well, you just got to see what kind of life she had. I, th I think she was a pretty, I don't know if she was on the edge of being crazy or, um, you know, what you say about her. Just very individual and unique. Um, she was the exact opposite. I mean, her life was a scandalous life. Uh, not necessarily known about it while she was alive, but uh, as we'll see, but after her death, uh, she became famous for her scandalous life. She was the exact opposite of those Tory feminists who were saying we claim the, the moral high ground. So, uh, I've used that word unimpeachable. It means uh, you can't challenge it, and you can't criticize it. It's un the, 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 the Tory feminists seem to be uh, morally uh, unimpeachable, beyond criticism. Well, she wasn't like that. Uh, the first thing that happened was that she fell in love with um, a married man, Henry uh, Fuseli. Uh, she was seduced by his erotic artwork and fell in love with him. I know he was. I mean, he, he, he enjoyed, you know, having relationships with women uh, outside marriage. It's, again, it's a case of he can be a bad boy, but she can't be a bad girl. She gets into trouble for it. Um, so, yes, uh, paintings like this. Um, all right. Uh, in fact, he painted, he, he painted her. Uh, he, she was one of his models, and she fell in love with him because she was modeling for him. Um, but she just loved the kind of gasping sexuality and the sort of erotic implications of his artwork. Um, and uh, she fell in love with him. And she, she, she's, she, 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 she wouldn't say that, the, that her, um, her feelings for him were sexual. She felt it was platonic. Platonic means, you know, a, a meeting of the minds, 
all right? That, that, that his mind was so wonderful and she loved his mind. Uh, it's a platonic relationship. It's not a sexual relationship. Um, Plato had the idea that, uh, that the, the highest level of love was um, in friendship, not in sex. Um, so uh, Plato is often... He, he often comes up in homosexual contexts because he felt that the, the highest level of love for a man was with another man as a friend. Okay, because uh, women were okay for, 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 for sex, but you couldn't really talk to them. They're very sexist, okay, very <laughs> uh, sexist old, old, old guy from the Greek period, okay. Um, I'm simplifying it a lot. But uh, basically, the meeting of the minds is, is what platonic love came to, to mean, the, the sort of mental affiliation, not, not a physical relationship. So she didn't see anything wrong with just going and quite literally just knocking on his door and saying, I love you, I want to move in. Okay, no, 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 it doesn't have to be sex, but just I want to move in. Why don't we all just live together? You, your wife, me, I mean, what, what you, hey, you know. Well, as I say, was she crazy? <laughs> what was she thinking? Fuseli and his wife were horrified. Okay? All right? They just were not going to buy this. And he was, he, was, he was horrified that this woman that he had been kind of, you know, flirting with and, and getting amorous with was coming and knocking on his door, asking to move in and embarrassing him in front of his wife. Look, I like my affairs with women, but I don't want them. You know, I don't expect them to come banging on my front door, you know? So she, she completely misunderstood what was going on. From his point of view, he just wanted to get her in bed. That was it. You know, she, she saw some great big platonic you know, uh, meeting of the minds and things. No, no. no she, 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 she got it all wrong. So she was in a, uh, a, a, pr a pretty bad position, really. There she was. Uh, she was 29 years old at this stage. Uh, she was apparently still a virgin in terms of sex with men, although she'd had a, a very close uh, relationship with a woman. Um, don't, I think there's questions about whether that was a sexual relationship or whether it was just a very close um, friendship. Um, but she was, um, she was famous already. She hadn't, she hadn't written her, her very famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, but she, she was... Uh, a published writer, and she was a well-known writer at that time. She was uh, well-received. Um, but in her personal life, she was now humiliated, rejected, hadn't formed a relationship with anybody that, that worked. Um, Fanny Blood died. Um, so she left London and went off to America, and uh, you could say on the rebound, fell in love with uh, Gilbert Imlay. And again, you know, she, she had his child. She didn't get married. Okay? She had his child without getting married to him. This is uh, very radical stuff for that time, okay? Um, a woman behaving in this sort of way just... Uh, but pe pe the, the, the society didn't really know how to cope with someone like her. But as I say, she was keeping it uh, a lot quite... She was, was keeping things rather secret at the time during her life. It was only after her death that a lot of the details came out. And she came to be um, seen as a, a very wild, um, unconventional sort of person. Uh, again, the, the relationship didn't work out. The child was born and they split up. Um, now, what she did here was, as I say, she kept things a little bit secret by calling herself Mary Imlay. In other words, pretending that she was married to Gilbert. Um, uh, actually, she, she, she wasn't. And what's going on in the bigger scene here? Revolution. Okay? France is in a, a state of revolution. So uh, she's actually gone to uh, Paris at the time of the French Revolution. So uh, there's a lot of sense of change, of atmosphere, of tension. Uh, some of it positive feeling. We're building a new society. Some of it despair, like what? Well, the, the whole world's falling to pieces. So, uh, and she was caught up in, in, in that broader uh, movement. And that's when she wrote her most famous work, uh, A Vindication of the Rights of 
Women, which came out in 1792. And is usually taken as the sort of uh, baseline, the, yeah, um, sorry, it's, the, the, the screen is a bit low for people at the back there. Uh, yeah, 1792, a vindication of the rights of women. women. She came back to England and uh, again, her emotional instability is uh, seen from the fact that she tried twice to kill herself at this stage. Um, and then uh, she began a new relationship and, and, uh, and became pregnant again. Uh, this time, uh, the child's father did marry her. The writer and philosopher William Godwin did marry her, but she died shortly afterwards. She, she gave birth to the child and, uh, and died. And that child was uh, born as Mary Godwin, she grew up to marry the poet Shelley. She was the author of Frankenstein. So it's kind of wow, isn't it? I mean, you just think about uh, what her life was. And, and, and uh, she died young, comparatively young, but all of those things that happened to her and the way that she lived her life, like a complete sort of naive in a sense, you know, an idealist, you know, thinking that she could go and knock on her lover's door and ask to move in. Um, a, a revolutionary there in France during the time of the revolution, the French Revolution. A very romantic kind of figure, isn't she? All right, so uh, after her death, uh, William Godwin, her, her husband, um, published a lot of her, her um, diaries and um, private information about her, and that's why she became kind of... Uh, remembered more for her scandals than for her writing after, uh, during the Victorian. Um, so, okay, I'd like to kind of put her in that French Revolution context for, for a little, um, little bit of time here. Um, There was actually a big debate going on inside France about how this new French society after the French Revolution, how is the society going to be built up? How is it going to work? What sort of society were, was France going to have now that they got rid of their elite, now that they, you know, they got rid of the king? And there was something called the National Constituent Assembly, which was sort of in between you know, the, the rule of the king and the, uh, the rule, the, the, the post-revolutionary government, it was sort of standing in between to sort of get a transition from the monarchic government to the new style of government. And these, this was a sort of committee, a group of people who were trying to work out what was the best path towards building a new society and having a new um, constitution. Um, and they passed something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. And women were bitterly disappointed, or a lot of women, French women, were bitterly disappointed by this document because it's a declaration of the rights of man. And it's using the word man. Now, in those days, of course, the word man was very often used to include woman. All right? It... it, uh, it, it, it it was supposed to be inclusive, that, that if you said man in certain contexts, people would understand you mean men and women. Okay? But no, man and the citizen, and the citizen has to be male. We are not talking about women here. We are talking about men. This is a, um, our new society. In our new society, every male member of the society will be a citizen. Well... Thousands of women uh, marched on the king's palace, uh, which was, uh, this, this famous march uh, was a, a turning point in the French Revolution. And uh, they presented the women's petition to the National Assembly. And they said, look, why can't you just make a society so that women also can be citizens? Why, why only men? 
why should you boys have all the fun? Okay, so they, they um, again, you know, one of these um, big political actions by women marching on the government um, and demanding, you know, change. So women's rights were right at the heart of the French Revolution and the debate that was going on at that time. And so uh, in 1791, uh, a French woman, Olympe de Gouges, uh, published uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen, advocating basically what we just said, that, that women should be citizens in the new France. Why not? And uh, the following year, Wollstonecraft published her Vindication of the Rights of women, Woman. Obviously, um, you know, influenced by or inspired by uh, Olympe de Gouges. And then, the year after that, Olympe de Gouges was beheaded. She had her head chopped off for writing that book, for challenging uh, the revolutionary uh, French government. Okay, this was serious stuff. Okay, people were getting their heads. She, she was, um, I think, the only woman who got her head chopped off. The others were all men. Uh, but she, she was considered, you know, her crime against society. I mean, it, it was a, it was a, they, the, you'd have to look at the, 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 how they, how they presented the information in court when they were trying her. Uh, they were twisting her words uh, to try to make out that she supported the king, which, you know, she, she, she rightly was arguing, well, that's not true. But it, the, the, the point is that they were frightened. Men were frightened, frightened enough to chop off the head of a woman who was trying to uh, advocate uh, that women should have uh, equal rights in the new French society. Now, it's not all that revolutionary, what she's written, in the sense that we've, as I've already said, we, we've seen a lot of this stuff um, already. Uh, she, she argues that uh, women uh, only appear to be incapable of intellectual reasoning. There's a reason why they, they don't seem to be able to reason intellectually, and the reason is because they haven't been given a proper education. All right, uh, they they haven't been brought up to do that. So how can you suddenly expect them to do it? Men can only do it after they've had an education. Women don't get the education. And they say, oh, they can't do it. Well, of course they can't do it. They haven't had the education that would enable them to do it. They haven't been given the tools. So uh, she makes that point, but that's not a new point. We've seen it already, haven't we? Um, she uses religious arguments. Okay, bend. Uh, me to the dust before God and loudly tell me when all is mute that we are formed of the same earth and breathe the same element. Okay, she's using religious arguments. God made us the same. It's only society that makes us different. Uh, she argues that uh, children get their earliest education from their mothers and that therefore well-educated children are going to make better mothers. And as I say, all of these points are points that we've, we've seen covered by Mary Astle and other uh, Tory feminists. Okay, she's, she's really uh, just echoing what these um, other earlier writers, particularly Mary Astle, uh, what they've already said. What makes her stand out is not so much what she says, it's the, it's the context in which she says it, this radical context of the French Revolution, uh, de Gouges getting her head chopped off okay, uh, by the guillotine, um, the, the whole sense of the fundamentals of society are, are possibly going to change. And of course, English society, once the French Revolution happened, and once the, the, they, they did start chopping off the heads of all the rich, basically, they tried to wipe out an entire social class, um, you know, England, there was one thing that England and Britain was, was very, you know, like, clear about. We don't want that to happen here, 
Okay, the ruling class did everything it could to make sure that there was no such revolution uh, going on in their country. They were terrified that the same thing might happen uh, in, inside Britain. And so, of course, uh, that influenced their feelings about feminism that was seen as even more radical than the radicals. Okay, the Fre even the French radicals, the revolutionaries, weren't prepared to give equal rights to women. Uh, so uh, somebody like uh, Mary Wollstonecraft arguing for equal rights to women was seen as being even more radical, even, therefore potentially even more dangerous than the um, uh, French revolutionaries. Now, Jane Austen seems like about as far away from Mary Wollstonecraft as you can get. She seems very conservative, um, sort of a small, a small world, a, narrow, a very narrow world, very acutely observed, but not, not, a, not in any way a radical. That's, that's uh, how we would tend to see her. Quite different from this sort of dramatic, adventurous, scandalous, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. But, you know, the appearances uh, may be misleading. We may actually need to think of, start thinking about Jane Austen a little bit different way. During her lifetime, as I've hinted, uh, Wollstonecraft was not particularly noted for her scandalous life. A lot of the details of her scandalous life came out when uh, Godwin published uh, the memoirs of the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. That came out in 1798, not long after, a few, just a few years after she died. Um, I'm not quite sure why he did it. All right. Um, I, I think he, I don't know, maybe he expected people to react differently to it. It didn't, it didn't work out very well for him because his name was now associated with a very, very scandalous woman and that he uh, uh, lost a lot of his status and position in society. So he may have just misunderstood or miscalculated his own society and thought that they would, um, because they respected her work, uh, they would respect her lifestyle. I don't, I don't quite know quite what he might have been thinking, but it, it didn't really work. I mean, when she was alive, her reputation was based on her writings. And then uh, after she died, her reputation became based on uh, her, her life. Um, in fact, as we've already seen, if we, if we take her life out of it, the things she's saying are not that radical. Um, uh, one commentator uh, writes, Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, the foundational work of Enlightenment feminist philosophy, endorses a feminism that is surprisingly conservative. We've already seen the points of similarity with Mary Astle and the uh, Tory feminists. Um, it's, it's only when you put it together with her lifestyle <laughs> that, that you, you, kind of real, you, you kind of feel that, that there's something radical in the air here. So what sorts of connections, if any, uh, can we find between Mary Wollstonecraft and, and Jane Austen? Uh, well, just as Mary Wollstonecraft's um, scandalous life didn't really come out until after she died, so the image that we have of Jane Austen was created largely for us after her death by her, uh, her brother and her nephew, who presented her as a very conservative, very quiet sort of person. They, they didn't want anybody to think that she was anything other than that. So it's very difficult to get to the real Jane Austen, because we, we, we mostly get about details of her life from her brother and her nephew. So who was the real Jane Austen? Okay, uh, uh, just as uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's scandalous life came out after her death, so the idea that Jane Austen had a very conservative life uh, was something that was spread after her death. 
right? She wasn't as wild as Wollstonecraft, no. But she did have things going on in her life. Um, she, uh, she didn't marry, but she received a proposal of marriage and accepted it and then said no within 24 hours. Okay, I mean, there were things going on. Right? If she was in a position of saying yes and then saying, well, actually, no. Okay, that's quite a... Uh, uh, it shows a strong personality, at least. And uh, reading her works, we, we, we always see her as being gently satirical, gently ironic. Uh, but there's some quite strong attacks on the uh, prejudices of the time that are kind of hidden uh, inside that apparently gentle irony. She makes some surprisingly radical attacks. Um, so when we actually look at her works from a feminist perspective, uh, we find that she's quite, um, she's, she's, not the sh she's not a shy shrinking violet or something. She's not a, a sort of, uh, cons cons she's not conservative at that level. <coughs> uh, Jane Austen has continued to fascinate people over 200 years, and, and there are reasons for it. We don't know whether she actually read Mary Wollstonecraft's work. We don't have any you know, definitive information about that. But there are some really quite interesting connections between the two women. Uh, Firstly, we do know that uh, Jane Austen had a copy of a work called Man As He Is Not, or Holmesprong, or Man As He Is Not, which was published in 1796. The author of that work was a definite admirer of uh, Wollstonecraft's work, and so we know that she had, that Jane Austen had a book written by an admirer of Wollstonecraft, uh, Robert Bage. Now, that novel very much supports women's rights. It very much advocates the equality of men and women. You've got very powerful, you've got this woman standing here with a gun saying, hey, get in my way. <laughs> this is a sort of symbol of, of, sort of women taking power, the woman taking the gun. All right, and uh, it's an illustration from the novel. It, it's about strong women taking a strong position and, and, and I don't need a man to stand up for me. I don't need a man. I don't need a man to chaperone me. I can look after myself, thank you very much. Okay, uh, it's it's taking a, that that kind of radical uh, assertion of uh, power and right, and uh, we know that Jane Austen had a copy of that. Uh, the uh, the text that goes with that. Let me see who dare. Just try it. I'll blow your brains out. Okay? So uh, it's a, a, a fairly strong image, sort of symbolically, uh, and the whole novel is geared towards uh, presenting women as being just as powerful, just as capable, just as able as, as men. All right? And that was a book uh, that was inspired by uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and that was in uh, uh, Jane Austen's uh, it was on her bookshelf. It was one of the books that she owned. So we do know that, and we know certain... There's a, a family connection. Claire Tomalin's written a lot of uh, biographies. You know, she writes The Life of Dickens, the, life, the Lives of Famous Authors, and she points out to a family connection between Jane Austen and Mary Wollstonecraft, which makes it even more likely she must, Jane, must, Jane Austen must have known about uh, Wollstonecraft, because uh, her father, um, he was a rector. That means he had a position in the church. Uh, he wouldn't have got a very big income from it, and so to, to get a bit more money, he would act as a tutor to, uh, to local boys. Well, not, not necessarily, yeah, mostly, I think, local or living in this sort of general area. Um, and so he was a tutor, a private tutor, and he supplemented his income by doing that work. And one of the boys that he was a tutor to was a boy called Gilbert East, and he was the son of Jane Austen's. Sorry, he was he was he was the son of a friend of Jane Austen's uncle and aunt who lived in Bath. 
Uh, Jane went, uh, spent time with James and Jane Lee Parrott, her, her uncle and aunt in, in Bath, and one of their friends was Sir William East, and the son of that friend uh, was, a, was, was tutored by Jane's father. Okay, so it's not, not, a, not a tremendously close family connection, but there's a, there's a family connection there. But it, the connection gets stronger. As we haven't yet linked it on the other side to, to Mary Wollstonecraft, so let me carry on a little bit. Uh, William East was the person, was, he knew uh, Mary Wollstonecraft very well. He, uh, during her second uh, attempt at suicide, he uh, took care of her, he, he looked after her, he helped her to uh, recover from her, her depression and despair at that time. So uh, that's the link uh, that uh, the friend of Jane Austen's aunt and uncle was uh, also a very close friend of Mary Wollstonecraft. So that kind of pulls them together in, in, as real people in life. Not, not, just, not just through their writings. It pulls them together as uh, having a kind of contact. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we, we, can, we can only suppose that, that they, you know, they, might, they might even have met. Okay? It's not impossible to suppose that they might have met. But um, even if she didn't actually meet her, it's hard to imagine that she wouldn't know about her. She spent time with those, uh, her aunt and uncle in Bath. She, she, she would have eaten meals at their table frequently. There would have been lots of conversation going on. You're going to say that never once did they mention Mary Wollstonecraft when she was such a close friend of their own close friend? It, it's pretty clear that she would have known who Mary Wollstonecraft was. She would have known something about Mary Wollstonecraft's writing. We don't know if she herself read Mary Wollstonecraft's work, but uh, it, it's, it seems much more likely when you think of this family connection. So uh, there's one school of thought that says the reason she doesn't mention Wollstonecraft is because she doesn't want to be connected with that scandalous sort of reputation. She wants to keep her reputation clean and not connect her name publicly to Wollstonecraft's, although privately, uh, and possibly intellectually in terms of her reading of Wollstonecraft's work, uh, she was actually quite close to her. So I mean, that would be one way of looking at it. It's just a theory. We can't really say for sure. Okay? But it does put uh, Jane Austen much closer. The circumstantial uh, evidence puts her much closer to Mary Wollstonecraft than we would ever have imagined um, from, from the kind of image that we have of her. Well, let's take a look at the way she uses names. A lot of these novelists from this period put a, a lot of thought into what names they were going to use for their characters, and uh, those names would have a sort of symbolic value. I mean, look at Mr. Knightley, okay, for example, that, that sort of use of names. Um, and uh, if we look at... Uh, the heroine of Mansfield Park, Fanny Price. Well, it's again, it's, it's just a theory, but it seems quite likely that uh, Fanny would be a reference to Fanny Blood, the, uh, the woman that, that uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was very close to in her 20s. Uh, and uh, that the surname Price is again a, the... Um, a, a reference to a sort of secret hidden reference to a, a, another close friend of um, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, Rich, Richard Price. So uh, it's possible, it's, in fact, quite critics, uh, so, 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 some, some critics consider it reasonably likely that uh, she was making a kind of reference there consciously. Um, and Reef, who I've mentioned before, uh, she makes a quite persuasive argument that Fanny Price is actually uh, a, an Enlightenment feminist. All right, she's an ex she she is Jane Austen showing this is what an Enlightenment feminist would be like, not as dramatic as holding a gun at men's head, all right, but but uh, is showing how she would behave, how she would take control of her life, how she would. 
how she would develop her circumstances and so on. Um, and so uh, Fanny Price in Mansfield Park is you're pretty close to what the Enlightenment feminist, the ideal Enlightenment feminist, might be as a person. Okay, uh, so um, that would all fit with her naming and the, the fact that her name is closely related to two important people in Mary Wollstonecraft's life. And uh, if you're interested in all of this, you need to go back to uh, Lloyd Brown's paper, uh, Jane Austen and the Feminist Tradition, okay, 1973 paper. Uh, he's, he, he's sort of the first person who sort of starts picking out the, the, um, the feminist aspects of Jane Austen's work and looking at her as a more radical character than she appears from her writings. Now he doesn't look so he 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 focuses he doesn't look at so much at Mansfield Park he focuses on uh, two other novels Persuasion and Pride and Prejudice, and uh, again he finds a significant connection between Jane Austen and writers like Mary Wollstonecraft uh, on the subject of female feel feelings or uh, psychology of women as we might use it uh, that, that expression today, and. Uh, Female education, Jane Austen's scepticism of, uh, of the um, types of female education that were being uh, proposed by um, experts like Fordyce and Gisborne, uh, she, she seems to be uh, attacking those ideas of education, which we, we saw, you know, how Rousseau, for example, was being attacked um, by uh, Wollstonecraft last week. I think we talked about that. Um, and uh, all these male experts in education, and Jane Austen is quite clearly kind of attacking those male experts in education in a way that comes very, very close to uh, the way Mary Wollstonecraft expresses uh, her disapproval of uh, men who think they know how women should be educated, men who think that it's appropriate for women to be educated in a way that will make them marriageable and attractive to men. All right. she, she, she's, she's very much saying, you know, aligning herself with Mary Wollstonecraft's ideas in her writings, but separating herself, distancing herself from her in life, so as not to be touched by the same scandal. At least that's, that's a one possible way of looking at it. I'm not saying that that, that is necessarily the truth, but uh, I think it's a fairly strong uh, argument. No. Okay. Um, things like uh, unsatisfactory marriages, pointing out you know, just how marriage doesn't work out. Again, that's kind of very much uh, an, uh, one of the uh, key topics of the early feminist writers. Uh, Astle wrote about it a um, hundred years or so earlier, and it comes up again. Uh, look at that. Uh, and one of the funniest ones is um, Mr. Collins, the, the totally unsuitable uh, person who, if, if you know Pride and Prejudice, you have these uh, five daughters who, when their father dies, are going to be penniless. Now, very often it's said uh, the reason they're going to be penniless is because women couldn't inherit in those days. That's not true. Women could inherit. But... In the case of uh, Elizabeth Bennet's um, father, she's one of the five daughters, the central one in the story. In the case of Elizabeth Bennet's father, he must have been a wild boy. And when, uh, when his father was making his will, he made a condition, the property must go to the nearest male relative. That usually happened when uh, they were worried about the son how stable he was, how suitable he was. They wanted to keep the property together for the family to continue into the future. And so uh, we, know, we know that Mr. Bennett married a, a pretty young woman who was not clever and spent the rest of his life regretting it. Uh, he, he was clearly a bit of a wild one, and his, so his parents had made this condition on his inheritance. Uh, so these five daughters have all got uh, a desperate need to find themselves uh, a, a rich husband. 
Look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth's behaviour in this situation is really quite extraordinary. She needs to find a rich husband or she is going to be poor. The day her husband dies, she's going to have nothing. <coughs> she gets a proposal from uh, the, the person. Mr. Connors is the closest male relative. He's the person who's going to get all the property. What does she say to him? She says, I, I couldn't marry. I could not marry you. Right? You know, she is being a very much an Enlightenment feminist here. She's saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to. I'm not going to play along with this. Um, she, Charlotte marries uh, Mr. Collins on the rebound. He he he. Since uh, Elizabeth says no, I won't have you. She goes off to. Uh, she, he he goes off to Elizabeth's friend Charlotte, um, who is also you know she's not married. She she's looking for a husband. He proposes to her, and uh, she says yes. She does play the game. All right. She's not. An enlightenment feminist. She's she's just a a, a a a poor woman trapped by her circumstances. And she says, "I I'm, I'm I'm not like you, Elizabeth, and, and I don't see that I've got any other chances. And I don't think it's so awful. I'm convinced that my chance of happiness with him, that is, with Mr. Collins, is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state." And Elizabeth says, "So they sure, undoubtedly." As happy as most people. You will be as happy as most people. Meaning, yes, you will. Most people are not happy in, their ma in those kinds of marriages. And you won't be either. All right, That's what she's saying here. Yes, yes, you will. You'll be as happy as most people. Which is not much. Our society is not giving women a fair chance to have a happy married life. Okay, It's quite a radical position to be taking here. Um... Elizabeth herself, well, uh, yes, uh, Brown points out the similarities again between um, Elizabeth and the ideal uh, Enlightenment feminist as, as put forward by Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, she's wild, she has an independent spirit, uh, she's, she's very much, you know, you know she, she tramps across in the... In the, in the the wet weather to see her sister who's got a cold. She, she, and they, they all look at her. What is this woman? You know, she's, she, she won't be. She won't fit into the normal sort of decorum of, 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 of this society. She's, she's something else, and that's what actually makes Darcy fall in love with her. Okay, that he, he sees her uniqueness, her independence of spirit, and, and he values it. Um, so uh, Jane Austen is sort of saying. You can fall in love with this new kind of woman. She can be great. She can be really something, something to admire, something special, something beyond, you know, this the, someone like Charlotte who's just sort of colourless and, uh, you know, isn't this exciting? You know, where women are going and what we're becoming. And so she's presenting the whole idea of an Enlightenment uh, feminist, uh, really, through Elizabeth and through other characters, uh, as I said, Frances Price and so on, in, in her... Uh, her, her other writings. So it's, it's, I say it's a fairly central theme that, that her, her characters are Enlightenment feminists. Okay? Um, dissimilar as she may seem uh, to Mary Wollstonecraft in lots of ways, um, she's actually, under the surface there, got a very uh, similar message. And uh, when it comes to uh, the discussion of education. Anne Elliot, for example, in Persuasion, saying, men have had every advantage of us in telling their own story. Education has been theirs in so much higher a degree. The pen has been in their hands. They've been the ones in control. They've written the history books. They've, they've uh, told it their way. And... Uh, When you get silly women, as you do in Jane Austen, almost always she points out that it's their lack of education that makes them silly. They haven't been educated to know any better. If they'd been given a good education, they wouldn't be silly like that. And her, her sensible women her, are all uh, in that sort of um, enlightenment feminist kind of mode, and they're all, they've all got a solid... Uh, background of education, of reading, of um, exploring life. 
So I, I think that these, uh, these links are, are, are more than coincidence. I think that there probably is um, a conscious connection between Jane Austen and uh, Mary Wollstonecraft that Jane Austen would have known and uh, admired uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's work or her ideas. She might have got the ideas through conversation and not read the book uh, or the books, or, or she might have read the books. We, we don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, she's uh, you know, on the same wavelength here and that uh, there, there's a, quite a strong connection. And that we can actually understand Jane Austen a lot better if we see her in the context of that kind of Enlightenment feminism and in the context of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. So even if, even if that's not true and, and there isn't a, a conscious direct connection, the similarity of their views um, also together with, you know, because Jane Austen is more on the conservative side, uh, like Hannah Moore that we mentioned again uh, last, last week, I think we mentioned her, um, that it, it does show that there's uh, a, a, a kind of broad feminist women the discourse going on. It, 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 it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it's not limited to political left wing or political right wing. It's, it's, it's sweeping across women uh, and their consciousness during the later part of the uh, 18th century, uh, partly perhaps influenced by what's going on in France and, and that, that change can happen. The way it's always been done doesn't have to be the way that it's going to be done in the future. Uh, and this is kind of uh, entering into uh, discourse and it's being reflected in all sorts of ways, in novels, in, in tracts, in uh, in people's approach to life and society, that there's a, a broader level of challenge going on. We've seen isolated examples of challenge going right back to the 16th century. Remember Jane Anger. Um, but uh, this is now uh, a, a broader kind of movement.